Welcome to the Jewish Drinking Show, the number one podcast for drinking in Jewish wisdom, history, tradition, and more. Hi. Welcome everybody to the 108th episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan. I'm very excited to welcome first time guest of the show, Eric Siegelbaum. Eric, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. For those less familiar with Eric here, he is a lot of things, including the 2020 wine enthusiast, 40 under 40 tastemaker, the food and wine magazine, 2019 sommelier, sommelier of the year, and also the wine guy for the Smithsonian Institute, amongst many other things. So Eric, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you could just say I drink a lot. It's a much easier intro. Well, that's on this show, it's not necessarily a distinguishing aspect. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to separate yourself out from the crowd here. All right. So speaking of which, wine, what are, what are you drinking on this recording, Eric? So, uh, you know, in preparation to talk about Israeli wine, I thought mm-hmm. I would drink some Israeli wine. This is the Yatir Creek 2018. It mm-hmm. comes from the Yatir Forest, which, you know, if, if you, the whole idea of like, we get to Mars, we find water, we terraform it. Well, the Yatir Forest is terraforming in action. It's the world's largest human planted forest. It's uh, in the southern Judean Hills, northern Negev in Israel. Mm. Uh, almost one tree for every Israeli citizen. So uh, it's like almost 5 million trees right now. And what I love, you know, what I love about it is weddings, birthdays, simchas, whatever, you, you know, it's, as you know, it's customary. You plant a tree in someone's name. That's why this this forest exists. The, we, we turn the desert into... Uh, into a uh, verdant and green and fertile environment. I shouldn't say we, I had nothing to do with it. But right <laughs> within the Yatir forest is the Yatir vineyard. So all these mm-hmm. wines come from this vineyard within this uh, forest. So this is the 2018 Creek. It is a blend of 73% Syrah, mm-hmm. 11% Cabernet Franc, 6% Petit Verdot, 7% Morvedra, and 3% Grenache, and 100% delicious. Awesome. And I can confirm that it's delicious because I had some at the 2022 uh, Kosher Food and Wine Experience where I met you in person, exactly. not just through Zoom. So I'm actually drinking this uh, Dalton Canon Red, not as fancy as, as yours, but 2021. We are not only drinking Israeli wines for this recording, we're talking about Israeli wine. So for those less familiar with Israeli wines, and there's a lot to talk about, right? let's i think i think it's a really helpful thing right off the bat not all israeli wines are necessarily kosher right correct i think or, that's or, the, or let me specify kosher certified yes I, I think that's one of the biggest misnomers about israeli wine i think i think the general american wine drinking populace jewish or not mm-hmm. think israel equals kosher kosher equals manischewitz manischewitz equals garbage therefore israeli wine equals garbage and that is not mm-hmm. the case by the way manischewitz is from upstate new york it's concord grapes you don't even mm-hmm. make quality wine out of Concord grapes. Um, <laughs> but no, Israeli wine, most Israeli wine is kosher because the largest market for Israeli wine is the domestic Israeli market. And that's where there's huge demand. The secondary largest market for Israeli wine is the U S and the largest demand for Israeli wine in the U S is for religious Jews who care about kosher. But, you know, I like to talk about kosher by coincidence, mm. right? that the wines are kosher has zero to do with their quality for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Just like if you think about an organic wine or a biodynamic wine, a wine can be incredible if it's organic or terrible. It can be incredible if it's biodynamic or terrible. It can be incredible if it's natural or terrible. That it is those things has nothing to do with is the wine good or not. And I think for a long time, people misunderstood kosher. They would think, oh, kosher means it's not very good. And that's just not the case. People think, oh, Mavushal is cooked. And like, no, mm. 200 years ago it was. Mavushal now is, uh, it's flash pasteurized. There's a French term for this technique. It's called flash détente. And it's the very same technique that some of the best wineries of the world use to concentrate color, correct for uh, maybe underripe grapes, smoke taint, etc. So like, for instance, Chateau Bocastel and Chateau Rias, two of the most highly prized wines in the Rhone Valley from mm-hmm. Chateau de Pop, both of them, they use that process. Many of the first growth Bordeaux use it. Many like Napa cabs, I don't want to say Harlan and Bond and, and whatnot, but so I won't name names, Screaming Eagle, I won't say these names, but they're using these processes because what, what this whole idea does is it concentrates color. Mm-hmm. It helps remove flaws for, uh, from unripe grapes in cooler years or when they have a lot of rain during harvest. In mm-hmm. vintages where there's smoke in the air, it can also help eliminate the smoke taint because ultimately it creates extraction of flavor and color without extended skin contact. It's so, almost like auto-tuning for flavor. Kind of, yeah, kind of. yeah. I would, I would almost say amplifying. 
I would say it's more like amplifying for flavor and minimizing, you know, turning down the lows and accentuating the highs. Mm -hmm. It's Uh, just kind of surprising as a kosher consumer for me to hear that this process that's used on certain kosher wines is also being used on wines that have nothing to do with, or would even dream of being kosher. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it, it over, you know, overwhelmingly improves the concentration, color, flavor, all of the above the wines. And in fact, uh, I had a tasting, we put together a tasting of Israeli wines from a number of producers. We got their Mavushal and their non-Mavushal, the exact same wine, same grape, same vintage. Everything was done 100% the same except for Mavushal, non-Mavushal. Yeah. We did a tasting with a number of secular sommeliers and wine journalists, and it was amazing. Um, I think the collective agreement was the Mavushal wines were much, uh, felt much more ready in their youth, and the non-Mavushal wines weren't as well loved in their youth, but f- the consensus was they would probably age longer. Oh, wow. uh, so it was a really fun tasting. It was mm. really great to sort of, to peel back that layer and, and undo some, some misconceptions. Um, if you My want mind's more, blown and we still have most of the episode to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this won't be, this will be the first of many if I do my job correctly. Um, other, other myths about Israeli wine. Um, you know, Israel is geopolitically the Middle East and that conjures images of deserts and sand dunes. And, you know, you've been to Israel, you know, the Negev isn't even a sandy desert. It's a rocky desert. But my point is people think Middle East, they think completely arid, non-fertile. Well, we know Israel is the land of milk and honey, but climatically, Israel is the Eastern Mediterranean. And what we're seeing now is an incredible change in what's being farmed from a viticultural standpoint for uh, over a hundred years. It was a lot of Bordeaux varieties Hmm. with some other varieties in there. And and if if you want, well, I'd love to get into the history of why that was, but the, the, the Hmm. ultimate reason is that those were were commercially demanded, commercially viable, commercially popular. And now in the last 20 years, we've got this next wave of Israeli wine producers saying, Hey, who cares what people want to buy? Let's make, Let's plant the grapes that belong here that will respond the best to this climate, to this soil, to this, you know, the concept of terroir Mm -hmm. and make the best wines we can, because in so doing, we will create the market because the wines are great. And that is like, we are in a renaissance of Israeli viticulture as a result. I do want to quickly say that we did have a two-parter episode with Adam Montefiore on the history of of contemporary Israel's wine from mid 19th century to the present. So we can do a quick refresher. Quick refresher. Um, and, and, you know, Adam's in a subtle uh, plug for those two episodes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Adam's an amazing human. I love Great. him. I've got his books right over there. Uh, on oh, my wow. shelf. Whenever we're in Israel, we, uh, whenever I'm in Israel, we get together. Since you had this conversation with Adam, you can, you can fact check me, but the very brief history is <laughs> we have the longest archeological records of, of commercial scale viticulture and winemaking in Israel than anywhere else in the world. Five to 8,000 years of records of that. In about the 600s, uh, when uh, the Babylonians came in as sort of the precursor to Muslim rule, wine and alcohol stopped. And it didn't really start up again until the late 1800s, thanks to the Baron Edmund de Rothschild of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, Mm. who came to Israel and was like, this place is incredible. I need to start a vineyard and a winery here. And he started uh, Israel's uh, oldest commercial winery, now known as Carmel Winery. He planted Mm. vineyards in Zichron Yaakov, which is where Carmel is based. And from the late 1800s, there were three or four wineries in Israel. It was Carmel, Tepperberg. I can't even remember the other one or two. And that was it. And Mm. in the hundred or so years to the late 1990s, that that number jumped from three to 30, which Mm. exponentially is a lot. But 30 wineries for a country is not a lot. You Mm. know, we always like to talk about the fact that Israel fits inside New Jersey. New Jersey has more than 30 wines. And when was the last time you had a New Jersey wine, right? So... (laughs) From the early the late 1990s, early 2000s until today, 2022, that number has increased to almost 340. And it is those 300 new wineries that are the next wave, the first, the, either the, the second or third generation from the older winemakers or the first generation of new winemakers that are saying, hey, let's make the best wines for the, the Eastern Mediterranean climate. Let's respond to the changing climate of the world. Mm. Let's respond to the terroir of what Israel is and what Israel can be. And that's why you're seeing such incredible things like, you know, 2000 meter elevation vineyard, natural acidity Riesling or, or sparkling wines that, you know, that can compete with some of the best of them. In fact, actually this, this one right here, the spark on altitude 720, this is a Cabernet vineyard at 720 meters. Hmm. That's like 2,300 feet. And, you know, like the Argentinians love to say like, Oh, our Malbec, it's grown so high. It's at a thousand, you know, a thousand feet, 1500 feet, 2000 feet. It's like, yeah, well, we got Israeli Cabernet higher than that. So it's just, it's just a shift in the perspective of what's happening. Um, and it's largely a forget what 
what is we think the commercial demand is and let's make the best ones we can. Mm. That is the, the, the fundamental key point of the, the, the renaissance of Israeli wine. You keep talking about the terroir, the distinct aspects of, of the soil. How much does that differ from, let's say, the Golan Heights or the Galil or something more coastal or the desert? How much does the terroir affect the different wine? What are the five or six? Okay, yeah. So I will say this. The Appalachians of Israel are fairly loosely defined, and they were defined largely on political boundaries, not on geological boundaries. Welcome Most to the Middle wine- East. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, something about a border, and then the border changed, and then the border changed again. And everybody <laughs> says it's theirs. So, uh, what I'm talking about. Yeah. So a lot of the Appalachians are are, are very much uh, politically defined, rather than necessarily geologically or climatically or terroir defined. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, right now the Israeli government has launched a massive program in collaboration with you know, a couple hundred Israeli wineries to basically redefine the Israeli Appalachians and the Israeli wine map based on terroir. Oh, nice. And I'm going to get into terroir in a minute because you asked me about terroir and I, mm-hmm. I will explain that and make sure that anyone listening knows what that means and then how it applies to Israel. Mm-hmm. So the major regions, uh, roughly north to south, you've got the Golan Heights and then the, the Galilee div- subdivided into upper and lower Galilee. Mm-hmm. Then you've got um, the Shomron. Then as you head down, you've got the Judean Hills and then also the Judean Mountains and there's some sub-regions there. And then you go down into the Negev. Those are like the, what is it, five or six major regions within there are some subdivisions but Mm. ultimately because the appalachian laws in israel are really lax and really ill-defined you've got people putting all sorts of things on their labels and kind of not making it up but just in in a sense being like oh well this is where it's from so that's what i'm going to call it um so are the appalachians defined the naming conventions are they defined by within Israel, are they in, defined internally, or is it more of? A, and I'm definitely not a wine person, you can tell. Or is it more like an international wine association? How who comes up with these these naming conventions? That's that's an internal thing. Every country has their own has their really? own rules and laws. So yeah, what's oh. you know, it's it's a very listen. I love Israel. I, it's a very Israeli thing. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's the Judean hills, or maybe you call it Judean mountains, whatever. It's wine. Just yeah, drink it. Right, but it's all defined <laughs> internally, and and really for the very same reason that we had went from three to thirty wineries, and they're all fairly industrial commercial wineries, and only now do we have hundreds of small boutique wineries. There was no demand or reason to have a more defined Appalachian structure. And now there is. Mm. Now that people are understanding the capacity of what Israeli wines can do, they're, they're real, the Israeli government has is responded by really leaning in and saying, let's codify this on, on wine factors, not on boundary for border factors. How recent is that, that, or at least the desire to, to be more concrete about the Appalachians? So I don't know when this initiative started. I know it's in progress now. Like the, mm-hmm. they're actively in progress of redrawing the, oh. the Appalachians. And uh, from what I hear, we're maybe a half a year or so out. I think COVID put a slowdown on that. But mm. I, I would say we're about a half a year, a year out on that. I bet you know who will know? Adam Montefiore. You shoot Adam a text. He'll tell you. Be uh, he, up. Because he's very well. He's very actively involved in that. Oh, nice. Um, but to answer the sort of second part of your question. So we have all these regions. Look, the reality is most of Israel is limestone and terra rosa. Mm-hmm. Those are the major soils, whether you're in the Judean Hills or the Golan Heights or Galilee, remember, Israel is small. It's a very, very similar soil. The thing about it is people think terroir is the dirt. And while that is an aspect of it, it is only one element. Because it's in the name. Terroir is like earthiness, right? In French? Yeah, loosely defined, yeah. But the terroir, it's not just that. It's, it's the way I like to define terroir is terroir is this sense of place that allows you to eat taste or drink a product and know what that product is and where it came from. Wine is not the only thing with terroir. Olive oil has terroir. Cheese has terroir. Meat has terroir, right? That's why they're mm. Appalachians. You know, for instance, poulet de Bresse from France. It's a very specific type of chicken that from Bresse and it tastes very specific. And if you mm. know what it tastes like, you know, it could only be that. Cheeses especially have very specific, you know, uh, mm-hmm. terroir based on the milk of the animal, what the animal is fed on. You see this a lot in meat, especially with, you know, like don't want to talk trafe, but like, if you think about the different types of porks, the Iberian balota ham versus the, you know, the Iberico and all that stuff, like those are all mm-hmm. based on the terroir of where these animals come from. Right. So it's not just wine, but terroir is not just the dirt. It is the climate, the micro macro and meso climates of the region. It mm-hmm. is the slope, the aspect, the orientation, the proximity of the sun. I'll give you a great example. <laughs> New Zealand, South Island, Pinot Noir 
has a very specific terroir because if you remember the whole hole in the ozone layer thing, which is largely repaired, but the ozone hole was over the South Island of New Zealand. And it's still the ozone layer is much thinner there Mm. than it is everywhere else in the world. So even though the elevation might be the same, the slope might be the same, the soil might be the same as another region, let's say central coast of California, Mm. because it, because the ozone is thinner there, that affects the way the grapes ripen. They affects their UV rays. It affects phenolic ripeness. And therefore that is part of the terroir of New Zealand. Oh, right. Wow. So, so it's, it's terror is abstract, but it's all of the elements that give something a sense of place for Israel. The differentiating factors is less soil. Again, it's mostly limestone and terrorosa. Mm-hmm. It's more elevation, like up in the Golan and the Galil, you're much higher elevation in the Judean Hills. You're quite high elevation. In fact, when I show people photos of the Judean Hills and I say, where do you think this is? I hear a lot. Oh, that's like Sonoma. That's that looks like Sonoma coast. Oh. I'm like, <laughs> nope, that's Israel. Wow. Uh, I'll send you some photos, but, uh, but yeah, so the, the terroir story of Israel is one that I think originally they're like, well, it's all the same rocks and dirt. So who cares? Like, here's, here's where a road is. So that's the border of Shamron, and the Shamron plain versus the upper mountains. And like, okay, we're in the Judean Hills and this, this one's taller. So we'll call that the Judean mountains. Cause it's a little taller, but it's not really a mountain. But now they're actually really trying to codify like what makes the grapes from this part of Israel taste different than the grapes from that part. Hello, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I wanted to break in and we're already talking about Israeli wineries. So I want to give you a sneak peek into the next episode featuring the founder of Jezreel Valley Winery, Jacob Nir David. So the Argaman, which thank God has just done so well, mm-hmm. you know, people laughed at us 11 years ago. We took inspiration from a winemaker named Avi Feldstein, mm-hmm. who before us had, t- had come out with a high-end uh, single varietal Ar- Argaman. Mm-hmm. But Almost nobody else had attempted it. Argamon is a very challenging grape to work with, but it's only grown in Israel. I hope you enjoyed that sneak peek into the next episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I wanna point out, we are gonna be taking a six week break for the summer, but that episode will be coming out in mid August. So stay, stay tuned. All right, now back into this episode. Is there, I mean, have you experienced much of, much of a differentiation in the different terroirs or the, or the different areas, appellations, regions, however you wanna characterize them? Yes, where I think it's most most uh, noticeable mm-hmm. is the upper Golan Heights and the higher elevation vineyards. Mm-hmm. Separately, the Judean Hills mm-hmm. um, and the Negev. Mm. That is where I can, generally speaking, have a good sense when I'm blind tasting wine, if I know it's Israeli. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is pro- it's probably from one of these three places. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I but- will say... Just as a quick, uh, so one of the episodes with Adam Montefiore, he mentioned that in 1976 is when the Golan Heights wine, when they started producing wines from the Golan Heights, the, that sort of high altitude growing. Okay. Yeah, because we didn't have the Golan Heights before that. Well, for 1967. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know, that whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and because it's such higher elevation, you mm-hmm. really do see a difference. And really where that difference comes in is natural acidity versus mm-hmm. added acidity. I remember talking, I won't name the winery or the winemaker, but I was talking to a winemaker, a uh, dear friend of mine uh, who has a fantastic winery in Israel that does export to the US. And we were chatting and it was like, I was trying, he's like, taste this Riesling. And I tasted it, I was like, this is amazing. I was like, where's it from? He points down the hill. And we were in Zichron Yaakov and he points to a vineyard. He's like, it's from there. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is a flat plane, a flat lower plane in a, what I know to be a very warm climate. I'm like, this can't be natural acidity. And in a true Israeli fashion, he goes, no, it's nobody has natural acidity here. Anybody who tells you that is lying. We all have, we have to acidify. Otherwise it wouldn't be balanced. Mm. That's not actually true because mm. of the high elevation in the Golan and the upper Galil, you do, and more and more you're seeing this, you do see natural acidity. And by the way, natural acidity versus added acidity. There's no, there's, it's not like one is right. One is wrong. It's just like wine is all about balance. And if, if it's too warm a region where you don't have enough acidity naturally, you, you add some and then you get your balance. But, uh, but the, big, the big change is up in the north where, where we can get an incredible, uh, cool subregion, high altitude natural acidity wines. So for those of us, maybe less into science or maybe just not that familiar. Yes, not sciencey. How do you get the acidity from the high elevation? Um, so... I want you to remember wine is from grapes and grapes are fruit. Mm -hmm. So think about unripe fruit versus ripe fruit versus overripe fruit. And think about the sweetness, the bitterness, and the sourness. Unripe fruit is sour and bitter, but not sweet, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Ripe fruit is a little sour, maybe a little bitter, but, but sweet. And overripe fruit is very sweet with no sour. Mm-hmm. It's because, uh, sorry, you're going to get science, but I promise it's going to be back to, I was going to say, it's back to balance, what you were just mentioning. Right. Here, see these thick glasses? I earned these. You're going to get some science. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when any fruit is ripening, mm-hmm. right, the plant is photosynthesizing. It's taking ultraviolet light through chlorophyll, converting that into sugars. Right? That's that's photosynthesis in a nutshell. As fruit gets ripe, there are more sugars in the fruit. And why that's important for us is that has nothing to do with the sweetness of the wine. But if you remember from like sixth grade chemistry, yeast eats sugar, it gives off two things, alcohol and carbon dioxide. Mm-hmm. Get rid of the CO2, keep the alcohol, you turn juice into wine, right? Mm-hmm. So we need the sugars. We actually refer to it, in like winemakers refer to sugar concentration as potential alcohol. But mm-hmm. as the sugars ripen, the acidities drop. They're inversely proportional mm-hmm. because acid is is a function of a lack of ripeness. So the more ripe the fruit gets, the more sugar, the less acid. And if we get to a point where there's too much sugar and not enough acid, you will have a finished wine that is very fruit forward, very high alcohol because sugar is the catalyst, it's the food for the yeast, Mm -hmm. but not enough acidity to give it the balance. And the acidity that's added, despite the fact that almost all white wines taste of citrus fruit in some way, there's really virtually no citric acid in wine. There's like less than half a milligram. Mm -hmm. The two common acids in wine are malic acid, which is what gives green apples, crab apples, the pith of citrus fruit, their bitterness. Mm -hmm. And then there is tartaric acid, which you know more as cream of tartar, Mm -hmm. baking product, the ingredient in tartar sauce, right? So when we talk about adding acidity, what we're actually doing is at some stage of pre or during fermentation, Tartaric acid crystals, like powdered tartaric acid, are added into the fermenting wine. It can also happen after the fact. Mm-hmm. And that just sets the, the acid balance of the wine to counteract the sugar ripeness, the fruit flavors, and the alcohol. Can we go backwards? Uh, how, does the, how, do the, how are the acids produced? Or are they always necessarily in a relationship with the, sh- the fermentable sugars? Yes. That, I mean, that's just how plants work. Oh. Um, that's, how, that's, how, that's how fruits work, right? As as photosynthesis continues, sugars increase, acids decrease. It's just, that's, that's the science of how nature ripens fruit. With the high altitudes that somehow produces higher acidity. Correct. The reason is it's cooler. Mm -hmm. Therefore the ripening period is lengthened because I mean, think about it when you're up high in the mountains, Mm -hmm. right? You need more layers. It gets much colder at night. Mm -hmm. So that there's a, 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 the differential in temperatures between day and night, we call it the diurnal shift. Mm -hmm. And as you're in higher elevation, that diurnal shift is, is more dramatic. It can change 20, 30 degrees, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 10, mm. 15, 20 degrees Celsius in a day. And in order for the plant to ripen its fruit, it needs sun, it needs mm. solar radiation, but it also needs heat or heat units. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, it, very cold nights means it takes a while for the plant to warm up. And then just as it gets warm, it starts to get cold again. Mm. So it prolongs the growing season, the ripening period of that plant. Is that the same in the desert in the South? For the Negev, yeah, to a, to a certain degree, yes. Okay. So the other thing that that prolonged ripening period does, though, mm-hmm. is it allows the flavor compounds, we call those phenolics or phenolic compounds, mm-hmm. to also develop, uh, it takes longer to develop, therefore they develop more intensely than something that ripens so quickly. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I don't have a good analogy for this, but just think about this. Mm-hmm. We have to pick grapes at a certain potential alcohol because otherwise the wine will be too alcoholic. It'll be, it'll ferment to 16, 17 degrees. It will be too hot. It will burn your throat. It'll feel unbalanced. That's not pleasant. Hmm. But if we, if it's so hot that we get to that ripeness so quickly, we don't allow enough time for the flavors to develop. So sorry, more science. So with the term we use is liquidification. That's where stems (laughs) go from green to brown. So like the seeds of the grape go from green to brown, the stems of the grape go from Mm -hmm. green to brown. And then remember, Remember when you were a kid, you know, playing in a, in a park or whatever, and you'd break a stick and it would be green and you couldn't really break it. You'd, you'd like try to like snap it, but it wouldn't It'd be that sort of like vegetal sappy note versus mm-hmm. a dried stick, which is, doesn't have any of that. So mm-hmm. that's because the green 
twig is those phenolic compounds haven't ripened out and in a dry twig they have. So it's the same with wine. So the longer, the cooler climate or the cooler nights allow for a longer ripening period. So not just a more balanced wine, but more intensity of flavors in the wine as well, beyond mm. just fruit concentration. So that's why you can, you were mentioning there's three regions. You can really tell that they're maybe of a higher quality or a certain region, right? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say quality or lack thereof. Quality is more about the winemaking. It's oh, about so the, the harvesting and the then. winemaking. But there are th- those are the three regions that to me have the most signature. If I am blind, listen, if I'm tasting a wine, I don't know it's Israeli, I might not get there. But if I know I'm tasting Israeli wines, mm-hmm. I can reliably hone in on the Negev, the Judean Hills and uh, the Golan Heights because there's a little bit more of that terroir signature than necessarily like the Shonron Plain or, or, or another region. And are, are, how would you, what are the telltale signs of those signatures? So, um, Golan, mm-hmm. hot, natural high acidity. You know, I, I am, I have a, a practiced enough palate that I can actually often tell if some, if a wine has been acidified, if, if mm. acid has been added into it, mm-hmm. um, generally, if this is a little abstract, well, you visual arts, so liberal arts, so this won't be so abstract for <laughs> you, but like, if, if it feels like the acid is sitting on top of, but not integrated into solution, mm-hmm. that to me is a sign of added acidity. Mm-hmm. And also added acidity reminds me of, remember sprees or sweet tarts, those candies? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it gives that sort of powdery feeling mm-hmm. because ultimately they're out, adding powdered acidity is what, what it is. So mm-hmm. if I, if I get like really intense natural acidity and, and, and like uh, a lot of phenolic ripeness, that's probably, that is probably from the Golan Heights. If, um, if I get a really intense limestone note, that's probably from the Judean Hills mm. and from the Negev, it's like a combination of like very, very ripe fruit, but not, but also, um, really good secondary notes to it. So the non-fruit flavors, so vegetal savory notes coming in behind it. Mm. That's generally my sign of the Negev. But again, it's like, it's hit or miss. You could put 10 wines in front of me. I could get go 10 for 10 or 0 for 10. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. This is, this has been really great. We went down a science rabbit hole. A little segue. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, well, it was a, it was, we went down the science rabbit hole. How, I kind of want to go back to how we started, which is, I want not necessarily dispelling myths or how we, you know, things that these misconceptions people have, but how would you like when you introduce people? Because I knew you introduced people to Israeli wines mm-hmm. or wines in Israel. What are I don't know? What, what do they say? What are things that surprise them? Maybe um, that and that and by the way, that doesn't have to necessarily be distinct to Jewish or kosher consumers. It can just be anybody when they're yeah. experiencing kosher or being confronted with Israeli wines. So I think the number one thing that surprises people about Israel is that Israel makes wine, and then the secondary thing that surprises people about Israel is that Israel makes wines that are more than and shout it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also, if you have topics as well as uh, potential guests, including who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you. And now back into the show. Israel's two biggest markets were domestic and, and export to Jewish Americans. Mm -hmm. And, and because Jewish Americans didn't really care about quality, Israel was just producing what was commercially viable, not what, not what was necessarily delicious. Right. It's, it's it's business smart to make it kosher. Oh, hundred percent. Know know your market. Yeah. Listen, wine is expensive to produce. Producing Mm -hmm. a bottle of Pinot Noir, Cabernet or Chardonnay costs a lot, whether you do it in uh, the Judean Hills or whether you do it in uh, France or whether you do it in Sonoma or whether you do it in Virginia or whether you do it in Chile, there's a certain cost to that. Mm. And when you're a country that's not very well known on the export market mm. and you're putting out a Pinot Noir that costs $45 a bottle, the, the natural response is if I'm going to spend $45 on, on a bottle of Pinot, I'm going to get something from Willamette Valley, Oregon. I'm going to get something from mm. Burgundy. I'm going to get something from the Carneros. I'm going to get something from the Central Coast, like Santa Lucia Highlands. Mm. Why would I spend that money on an, on an unknown? So right. it's not that the wine wasn't of value. It was that there was an, a misunderstanding of the value proposition and an unwillingness to try as a result. So let me ask you, you have a, you have a sense of, of sort of where the buyer market is at with wines. How... 
how I don't not necessarily I don't even want to say well regarded how known how well known are Israeli wines and also I guess in your experience how much have you done to expose people to what Israeli wines have to offer well they're not very well known which is why I do what I do right it's yeah. ex- ex- it's exactly for the reason that they're not mm-hmm. that well known which is mm-hmm. why I do what I do mm-hmm. and my my whole approach is to see Israel through a different lens. Mm. I, I, I tell the importers, the distributors, the salespeople that I work with, I was like, I don't want you talking about Israeli wine to kosher restaurants. I don't want you talking about Israeli wine to kosher mm. retailers. I don't want you talking about Israeli wine to Mediterranean restaurants. I want you talking about Israeli wine to Italian restaurants, to French restaurants, to mm. American restaurants, to steakhouses, because Israeli wines play so well in those arenas and one of the problems is, oh, it's Israeli wine. So only an Israeli restaurant or only a Middle Eastern restaurant. And that is just categorically false. Mm-hmm. And you know, we know this is true. And I can tell you why. Have you ever been to an American restaurant and seen French wines on the list, Italian wines on the list, Spanish wines on the list? Well, should it just be only American wines? Mm-hmm. No, because those other wines go well with the cuisine. Mm-hmm. The same with Israeli wine. So yeah. I, I tell people, I tell sales reps, I tell everybody I work with, like Israeli wine is more than just kosher. It's mm-hmm. more than Middle Eastern. You need to you need to look at it through a new lens and expose people who don't care about kosher and who don't run Israeli or Middle Eastern retail or restaurants. This is the wines you should be looking at. Let's look at the value proposition of this Cabernet or this Syrah or this Pinot Noir versus the other things at similar price points and how much these over deliver on quality at the price point relative to the competitive set. That brings me to another question. You're mentioning different varietals. I know you mentioned earlier at the outset in the 19th century, they brought over these French varietals. What are common, if you could put them into buckets, what are common varietals these days that fit well with the terroir in Israel? So I will say the most commonly produced wines in Israel still are what we call the Bordeaux family. So a lot of people misconstrue Bordeaux as a grape. It's not, it's a region. Mm-hmm. But the Bordeaux family of grapes, for the red grapes, it is in order of importance, Merlot, the mm-hmm. most important red grape. Mm-hmm. Don't let sideways fool you. Cabernet Franc. It fooled me. Yeah. Well, the the way, I was coming, I was coming of drinking age when sideways came out and that was my first exposure to Merlot. I stayed away from it for a decade. It's, you're not the only one. You know, the irony of that whole movie is the, the his prized wine, that 1967 Cheval Blanc, is like 87% Merlot. They put <laughs> that in as a joke and nobody got it. No. And it really, it I'm a victim both. too. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it really hurt the Merlot industry. It also really hurt the Pinot Noir industry, if you can believe it. Really? Um, Why Pinot yeah. Noirs? Well, uh, we're going we're gonna to go on a, on a, on a tangent again, right? It's because it created such an inflated demand for Pinot Noir that wineries were selling out in seconds. They were doubling, tripling, quadrupling their prices. They were they were ripping out old Merlot vines because they couldn't sell it and planting young Pinot, taking second and third harvest, which is like way too young fruit that doesn't have much to deliver flavor-wise, mm. quadrupling the price and pre-selling and selling it all out. So it did a huge amount of damage to the quality and the yeah. value proposition for Pinot Noir globally. And we're still seeing the effects of that. It's quite, it's counterintuitive. I know. But, wow. Um, That's bizarre. I, I, I imagine, I know like experientially in the kosher market, Cabernet Sauvignon has really done well. Yeah. It's it, sort of in, no one wants to touch Merlot's. They'll go. Right. Cab. That's not just in the kosher market. That's, oh, that's really? the market. Oh, you know, it's funny. We're, we're going to segue off this tangent and I'll get back to answering your question. But like <laughs> there, you know, you talk about Cabernet Sauvignon there, there's two people I want to meet. They're fictional people. I don't think there's one individual yeah. that exists, but uh, in theory, there, there are these two people I want to meet. Person number one is the person that took kale from being the thing that I grew up with being over the ice under the salad bowl at the salad bar to being like the very first thing that sells out at Whole Foods when a storm is coming. <laughs> right? Kale chips. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The other person I want to meet is the person that marketed brand Cabernet Sauvignon. So mm. many wine drinkers think like Cabernet Sauvignon is the apex. Boomers and the, the elder generation of boomers sort I was of gonna, I was gonna say along. kosher. I was going to say kosher consumers, but I guess, yeah. It's not just kosher consumers though. It's all consumers. Wow. The boomers and the older generation pass that along. Mm. And, um, you know, you have... We always go to the same steakhouse that's 545 every Sunday. We have to sit in the in a booth. Uh, I get the, the prime rib. It's got to be the end cut extra well done. We, I get the, the prime rib medium rare, but I always make them grill it back up to medium. You know, like it's the, and we always drink the same Napa Cabernet, whatever it is. Right. So the other person I want to meet is like who convinced everyone that brand Cabernet Sauvignon is the be all and end all because. The reality is what, what I love about being a sommelier, and I've been a sommelier for nearly 20 years, I've mm. always had fine dining steakhouses in my 
wheelhouse. When mm-hmm. I was the corporate wine director for Stephen Starr and Star Restaurants for six years, we had a number of upscale steakhouses. Before that, I was running Schwartz Brothers in Seattle, where there's four fine dining steakhouses. Like I've spent a lot of time in fine dining steakhouses. And whenever a guest would say, "Oh yeah, we're having steak. Uh, we should have Cabernet," I'd be like, "Great. Tell me what you love about, about Cabernet." Mm-hmm. And about 999 times out of a thousand, they write this most incredible, effusive, uh, visceral, master sommelier quality tasting note for not Cabernet Sauvignon, but Syrah. Oh. They're so enamored with the idea of Cabernet Sauvignon. I actually wrote an article. It's called Most huh. Cabernet Sauvignon Drinkers Love Syrah. They just don't know it. Yet. Right? <laughs> it's because- I totally thought you were going to say Merlot, but. No, no, Syrah. <laughs> the idea is they think Cabernet is what they're supposed to be drinking. Mm. And therefore that's what they drink. Not that Cabernet is the best. It's just, that's what they're told they're supposed to drink. So mm-hmm. they drink it. Wow. Um, but yeah, sorry. We, we, we got on a segue. So back to your question about the, what's most co- popular varietal wise in Israel. Yeah. So the major, the major grapes, they're still the most commonly produced grapes. Those are going to be the Bordeaux family grapes. So Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Mm-hmm. And Petit Verdot, <laughs> doesn't often um, taste very good on its own. Hmm. You rarely see varietal Petit Verdot or 100% Petit Verdot. Hmm. Israel is one of the few places in the wor- world where 100% Petit Verdot is delicious. I firmly believe really? I firmly you- believe the best Petit Verdot comes from Israel. And you see in Bordeaux style blends. Wait, any particular region? Uh, Galilee for the most part, but mm-hmm. the whole country. It just well, does really well there. It likes the terroir, it likes the climate. Hmm. Um, but what, what's interesting is in Bordeaux style blends, like in Bordeaux, Petit Verdot is two, three, maybe 4%, occasionally five or 6% of the blend, maybe. Oh, in wow. Israel, you see Petit Verdot at, at 20%, 30%, 40%, 50% of a blend, and sometimes 100% mm. because it does so, so well there. So those are the Bordeaux red varieties. The mm. Bordeaux white varieties are Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. You don't see a lot of Semillon in Israel. You do see a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. Mm. And then the other varieties that you see very popularly that are for commercial viability are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So mm. those are like the, the Israel of yesteryear. And mm. let me be clear, all of those grapes do very well in Israel. But as we talked about earlier, Israel is the Eastern Mediterranean. And this movement to Mediterranean varieties has been a game changer. So, Carignan in Israel. In fact, uh, Edmund Rothschild, he planted those Bordeaux varieties in the 1800s. And he also planted Carignan thinking this is going to do really well here. Now, it turns out he was right and wrong. He was 100% right that Carignan is going to do really well in Israel. He was 100% wrong with the biotype of Carignan that he planted. Mm. It was not correct for Israel's climate. And for a hundred years, it didn't, it was lackluster, disease prone, didn't, didn't really produce anything very good. Mm-hmm. And now in the last 20 or so years, they've really identified the right biotype of carrying And Israeli carrying is some of the best I've ever had. Not just wow. for carrying like wine wise, put it on your radar. Cause I think carrying is, is like the grape that Israel can hang its hat on. Wow. Um, That's really but, cool. uh, so we're seeing a lot of Mediterranean varieties, Carignan, Grenache, uh, Syrah, especially Syrah has always been pretty big in Israel, but, but that's because it does so well mm. in terms of a flavor profile, like from a, from a terroir standpoint, Syrah does really well. So all these Mediterranean varieties are, are, are doing incredibly well. We're starting to see a sort of explosion of, of them as, uh, in, in terms of plantings, in terms of offerings, in terms of, uh, all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, keep, keep an eye on that because more, more great stuff is coming in the Mediterranean variety, uh, version of Israel. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I want to break in again, and if you have ideas beyond the show, beyond the podcast, beyond this video content, if you have ideas for what Jewish drinking can bring you, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's Zoom sessions, maybe it's uh, events, maybe, who knows, swag, please let me know. I'm very curious to hear from you any ideas, things that we can do, things that I can bring you from Jewish drinking. So feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. I'm happy to bring that to you. All right, now back into the show. Earlier, we talked about, we talked about varietals. We talked about different terroirs. We also talked about how the various areas of Israel, the Appalachians are largely driven by political borders. Uh, Anything interesting about history you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the very exciting parts of Israel is that there has been a resurgence of biblical era varieties, Torah era varieties, the wine, the grapes that would make the wine that 
Avram Avino would be drinking or mm -hmm. Rachel and Leah and Rivka would be drinking or Noah. Like mm -hmm. these varieties are now coming back mm -hmm. and you can get wines today from these grapes. They're, they're mostly Aramaic or Arabic names and I'll explain why, but okay. grapes like uh, Dabuki, Hamdani, Jibali, Bituni, uh, mm -hmm. Mowawi. Mm -hmm. So the, all these grapes were thought to be extinct. And in recent years, they uh, they were found there. There are a lot of table grape growers that are Palestinian or in the Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a couple of growers that held all these grapes. They couldn't really identify. They didn't know what they were sort of growing wild in their fields. And they reached out to uh, Dr. Shivi Drory uh, from Ariel University, mm -hmm. biological viticultural science expert of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they were basically saying, what what are these? We have no idea. And he did some genetic biotyping. He was able to identify these six or seven biblical era grapes. Wow. Um, what, I, what I love about this, first of all, they're, they're really cool. They mm. taste awesome. You know, I, I can't really explain what Marawi tastes like. You just have to try it. And actually Sadal, mm. uh, this producer makes a varietal Marawi that you can get here in the U S. Um, but what I also love about it is this is a joint Israeli Palestinian project. It supersedes any, it's, it's proof positive that wine supersedes ideological, cultural, or religious differences. Um, and it's a perfect example of how Israeli organizations, Israeli funding and Israeli cooperation is helping to uplift the lives of many uh, uh, growers, Palestinian growers, to give them great sources of income, to help them propagate the, the richness of these biblical era grape varieties. And it's really cool. It's it just like to me, it's like this is the, this is the Israel I want people to see. Not the not the the sensationalism version of like what's going to get the most clicks, right? Um, I think that's really important. There's also another very interesting grape that is named, to my knowledge, the only grape that is named in the Torah, and that grape is Argamon. Hmm. And Argamon, uh, I should be quizzing you. I don't know how, how good you are <laughs> your, on your on your on your Rashi here, but Argamon <laughs> is the grape that was used to dye the the robes for the Kohanim. Mm. And I don't remember for which sacrifices, but I believe it's specifically mentioned and, and any like Torah scholars, please fact check me on this, but not for all the sacrifices, but for certain sacrifices, I believe Argamon is mentioned by name. You know, it's like two tenths of an epa of flour and one <laughs> eighth of a dunam of this, right? But Argamon is specifically wow. mentioned for both its pigmentation for dyeing the, the priestly robes and also for certain sacrifices. So we don't know what Argamon is, it went extinct, but a group of viticulturalists and Torah historians got together and based on the, the Talmudic and Torah references, tried to, to the best of their ability, recreate as close as they could what Argamon might have been like. So we have Argamon in Israel. It only grows in Israel. 100% of the world's plantings of Argamon in Israel. Only a few producers are working with it. My favorite expression is from uh, Jezreel Valley Winery. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it is actually a blend. It was made in the 70s. It's a blend of Carignan. We talked about the importance of mm -hmm. Carignan in Israel. And Suzao, which is a Portuguese, very thickly pigmented red variety. Mm. Uh, Argamon is delicious. Just had a bottle of it last night, as a matter of fact. Wow. Um, and that is a uniquely Israeli wine that is only available in Israel. It's not technically indigenous because the Argamon, modern Argamon, is a, a genetic cross, crossing mm. the grapes but it only exists in Israel. So you want, I guess mm. you could say it's not indigenous, but it's autochthonous. So that's another wow. cool thing to look out for. That's really cool. That's really cool. All right, Eric, this has been really fascinating. Thank you so much. This has been really, this is really, really fantastic. Before Thank we go, you. is there actually, before we you promote anything, you, I forgot to mention this in your bio, sommelier.com is where people can find you, right? And it's not spelled in a typical fashion. It's no. S O M A L. Yay, -A -Y com, right? Almost. S O M L Y A Y. Som L Yay. Thank um, you for the correction. Yeah, of course. Yeah. S O M L Y. It's actually vsomelier.com is the website. Oh. So V H E S O M L Y A Y.com. Um, it was born out of honestly a frustration when people mispronouncing the job title. Oh, you're a Samarne, a Somalian, a Samelia. Oh, no, it's I was going to say Samelia is probably the right yay. most. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Psalm L. Yay. Uh, yeah. But also the, the yay is sort of my personality. So yeah, the mm -hmm. is my website. Also, 
Um, as long as you spell my name correctly, it's uh, Eric, E-R-I-K, Segelbaum, S-E-G-E-L-B-A-U-M. There's only one of me on the planet with that name. There are only about really? four in Segelbaums. All, That's pretty impressive. All. Yeah, the, the entire family tree, we're, we're two branches of the same family tree. Every single single bound, we are either cousins, siblings, uh, distant, distantly removed cousins, or we're on the other branch of the tree. But there's like two two clusters of single bounds, but there's under 100, like 50 to 100 of us on the planet. Are you Levine? No, I'm uh, Yisrael. Really? Okay. Yeah, Figure with yeah. a name like Seagulls in there. Seag- seagulls yeah, are typically no. Levine. Okay. No, um, no, we're, uh, we're Yisrael. Um, okay. but, um, but yeah, so as long as you spell my name right, I'm easily found. Okay, great. All right. So now before we close out, is there anything you'd like to promote, Eric? Wine is a fantastic adjunct to life. It's important from a halakhic standpoint. It's important from a happiness standpoint. Important from uh, a biblical standpoint. It's a, Exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that people don't realize is how tough the people who have chosen wine as a career might have it. Mm. So I am a sommelier. I no longer work in restaurants, but I did for many years. And, mm. you know, Ferrari dealers don't really drive Ferraris. Right. Sommeliers might deal in luxury, but most sommeliers live paycheck to paycheck often don't have benefits. You usually have to have a, a partner that's also in the industry because we work what everyone else plays. So we work nights, weekends, holidays. And uh, the pandemic really hit the industry hard with all the restaurants being shuttered. So uh, I am the founding vice president of a charity. We are the United Sommeliers Foundation. Um, so www.unitedsommeliersfoundation.org. And uh, we started uh, in March of 2020 because we were seeing all of our colleagues. We're a very tight community. There's tens of thousands of sommeliers, but we're all like one or two degrees of separation. It's kind of like Jewish geography. Like you meet somebody, <laughs> you know, and who knows in Spain and, you know, they know someone who knew someone who lived next door to you when you on the house where you grew up or went to your school or something, right? It's the same idea. Sommeliers are very, very closely connected. And we started to see our colleagues lose their jobs with no hope of return, no benefit, not being able to pay their rent, their mortgages, not being able to put food on their table, pay their medical bills, keep their lights on. And so we started this organization uh, to help provide emergency financial assistance, originally born out of COVID, but not exclusively for COVID. Basically, we exist for any sommelier who is in dire financial straits through no fault of their own. If you mm-hmm. walk off your job and quit and give the finger to your boss, then no, we're not going to help you. That's not what we're here for. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. To date, we've raised a little over a million dollars. We've distributed most of it um, to mm-hmm. over in over 1,600 awards, financial grants and awards to wow. uh, someone who's in need. We have paid people's mortgages, their car payments. We've paid a year's worth of cell phone. We've, we've paid medical bills, uh, child care. Um, but uh, regrettably, the need is still great. So mm-hmm. if anyone in here is listening, uh, no amount is too large or too small. This is 108th episode. 108 is a great number. Uh, mm-hmm. 18, 36 mul- multiples of high are a great number too. Mm-hmm. If you need to know how to spell million, I can help you out when you're making <laughs> donation requests. Um, but, but really, even, even if it's like a dollar, no amount is too big or too small because regrettably, uh, after COVID, we saw the wildfires in Oregon, Washington, California. We saw mm-hmm. the, uh, the apartment collapse in Florida. We saw hurricanes and flooding and all these things. So we basically exist to help these people who really like without a job, have nothing, mm. make sure that they can, can stay sustained. And, uh, you know, uh, it's been gut wrenching, but also Im- immensely positive to, to be on the board of this organization to basically we built a charity from scratch with no experience. Uh, we did receive our 501 C three. So if you don't, thank you. It is hundred percent tax deductible. Um, and, uh, just remember if you're listening to this, I have a feeling it's because you like wine. And if you're also, you know, Jewish, you're probably Sadaka minded. So, you know, <laughs> two birds with one stone, you can support wine. You can support the people that support wine and, uh, you can do a mitzvah. So, uh, United Sommeliers Foundation.org, uh, Sommeliers spelled correctly S O M M E L I E R S. Um, no amount is too small. And moreover, if you know of any sommeliers that are in critical financial need, it may be the restaurant you used to go to and now they're closed and the, you, know, you had a relationship with the wine person and now you know that they're struggling, please direct them to us to apply for funding. Wonderful. Eric, thank you so much. And before we go, L'chaim. L'chaim, thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. L'chaim. I can't wait to come back if you'll have me. Yes, absolutely.